Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sebastien Kortman, Sebastian Kortman, Bas Kortman. I'm the rector of this university, as some of you may know. And on the occasion of the 12th Radboud Lecture, it's an honor and pleasure to welcome so many people at our university. And I extend a special warm welcome to Professor Dominique Moisy, who will be giving us this lecture tonight. Monsieur le professeur, je vous souhaite une chaleureuse bienvenue à Nimeg et à notre université. Et je vous remercie cordialement pour votre visite. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may know, Professor Dominique Moisy is one of the world's most influential political thinkers. He is especially renowned for his expertise in international political relations. Moisy has worked for a number of prestigious academic institutes in France and abroad as professor, teacher and advisor. He is a scholar with an excellent reputation all over the world. Professor Moisy is an European to the backbone. He has always been a strong supporter of a strong and unified Europe. His book, The Geopolitics of Emotion, published in 2008, has earned him worldwide acclaim. In this book, he argues that global politics are not only determined by material interest, but also by strong collective emotions of fear, hope, and shame. Professor Moisy uses the word geopolitics not in a mechanical way, but in a special way by bringing together the words geopolitics and emotions. As he says himself, he wants to create a provocation. And that's what we are looking for in academia, provocation. So it's time to give the floor to Professor Moisy. As you may know, after the lecture of Professor Moisy, there will be room for discussion, and Dr. Joost van Vught will be the moderator. Professor Moisy, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Don't worry, these are going to be my only words in French. I know we lost the battle a long time ago. <laughs> and my universalism uh, will use Shakespeare instead of Molière. I will start with an experience I had a few days ago in Brittany, a region close to the heart of your rector, I was walking on the beach of Saint-Malo, beautiful city, perfect light, an atmosphere of peace, which brought immediately to your mind why the Impressionist painters love so much that region. I mean, nothing could have been more perfect. The sea, the, the sky, the sand, and there was a little toddler barely walking, playing in the sea, which reinforced my impression of peace. And next to that little boy, there was his mother. And there was a slight detail that struck me. She was wearing long trousers as she was entering the sea to take care of her child. She had a veil. I could see her face, but she had entered the sea fully dressed. And then something happened. There was a little boat that came, 
the boat was guided by a man with a long beard and fiercey eyes. And I suddenly seized, I suddenly felt seized by a kind of apprehension. I was possessed by fear. Uh, French had been taken hostages in Algeria. Uh, rumors of terrorist attacks uh, were taking place in my country. And seriously, I said to my wife, this man looks strange. Maybe one should report him to the police. And I felt immediately after saying that, the most likely absurdity of what I was saying. I nearly also felt ashamed of myself. How could I move so quickly from the celebration of life to the apprehension that another human being could be planning to take my life. This is what I've called the revelation of Saint-Malo and this is what I would describe as the triumph of fear. In a book I wrote a few years ago, I was trying to map the emotions of the world, giving colors to the various cultures. Where was fear most prominent? Where was hope most prominent? Where was humiliation most visible? And in 2014, six years later, if I were to publish the new version of that book, I would say, I see more fear now in the West than there was. I see less hope in Asia than there was. And I see at least as much humiliation in the Arab Muslim world as there was. And in a way, if you look at the world today, you understand why there is so much fear. The basis of the world we knew seemed to be crumbling in front of our eyes. There is the sense that we are in a plane, that uh, the climatic conditions are very harsh, and there is the suspicion that maybe there's no pilot in the plane. At the very moment, there should be someone in charge because the winds are so aggressive. And if you try to define that impression of loss of control of man over its fate, you come across immediately with the Middle East. And for the first time since 1916, since the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the boundaries created by Europe are specifically challenged by the so-called Islamic State, Daesh, who wants to erase boundaries that were artificial and created by the infidel. And in that project, we see 
the collaboration of young Europeans. I mean, there are, as I speak, thousands of young people taking to the streets in Hong Kong in order to protest in the name of democratic values. That as I speak to, there are hundreds of young Europeans trying to move on the other side of the Mediterranean to gain some kind of meaning for their life in joining a project which seems to us absurd and barbarian. They don't want to join the Middle East. They want to return to the Middle Ages. That is at least what we think, but not what they feel. And this dual situation is, of course, very puzzling because we are not only classically afraid of the other and what the other can do to us, but we are afraid of the other in us, within us. And that is a new situation. Not completely new, because if you go back to 9-11, you realize that the kamikaze, most of them came from Saudi Arabia, were educated for years in a technical university in the city of Hamburg in Germany. And those years did not distract them from their murderous project. They live like Europeans, they disappeared like Europeans, except the only thing they wanted to know from Europe was the way to conduct a plane and to transform a plane into a weapon of mass destruction. And if the Sykes-Picot agreement of 1916 are being challenged right now, it's clear that the next step will be the Balfour Agreement, the Balfour Declaration of 1917, setting up uh, a Jewish that will become a state in 1948. In Russia, you see also for the first time in a long period the rebirth of a strong revisionist instinct which challenges the status quo and the order in Europe. For the first time, maybe, since 1945, the boundaries of Europe were redrawn by force, by the use of military force and deceit. You may understand the Russian emotions. You may say, for them, Crimea has always been Russian. And in fact, part of my family came from Odessa in the beginning of the 20th century. I never felt Ukrainian. I always felt Russian. I felt that I owe something to Chekhov, to Dostoevsky, to Tchaikovsky. I knew I wouldn't be what I was without them as a European. So I can understand, in terms of culture, what the Russians are up to. But I can't accept the way they did it, which reminds me so much of the behavior of the Soviet Union. And I had 
a debate on French radio with the <coughs> Russian ambassador in Paris. I knew him very well. He was the KGB agent in charge of spying in, on my institute in the early 80s. And uh, when he started speaking, I felt immediately at least 25 years younger. The Soviet Union was bad. Uh, I must say it was a tragic moment. It was uh, the day the uh, Malaysian airline was shut down. And the Russian ambassador was immediately saying, it can't be us because it doesn't serve us. And it was an exercise of brutal propaganda that you could not miss. So you have to fix limits to the Islamic state between brackets in the Middle East. You have to fix limits to the Russian nationalism on the eastern part of Europe. After swallowing Crimea, why should they stop there if we don't set up limits to them? And that starts only the catalog, the archaeology of fears which we can have. There is something like climate change. I'm not a scientist. I can't prove it. But the climate is changing. And probably as a result of the action of men. And when you see the encounter between the absolute energy, nuclear energy, and the absolute unraveling of nature that leads to Fukushima. And here again, it's a legitimate fear. Man has invented an energy that is the greatest, the cheapest, the safest, as long as it works. And the most dangerous and in control uncontrollable when man loses control of it. So, we can only say to ourselves that those fears are legitimate. We are no longer in control of the world we live in the way we were yesterday. In geopolitical terms, the artificial simplicity of the Cold War has disappeared. There were two blocks, one logic, one set of rules, and two clearly distinguishable enemies who were two different approaches of the Western mind. Capitalism versus communism, democracy versus autocracy. But we understood each other. We were not always as much in control of each other as we wanted to be. We came very close to the nuclear apocalypse twice. 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis. 73, the Kippur War. But they were rules of the game. Today, no one is in charge. And... It's not only that, but it is very complex to prioritize our challenges. What is the most important challenge we are facing as Europeans? The fear of being blown up inside by fundamentalists, the fear of losing some sense of balance in Europe, because of Putin's ambition, 
to recreate around Moscow a sphere of influence in the anachronistic 19th century meaning of the term. So, in a way, this fear I'm describing is legitimate even if it comes at a moment when life is changing for the best. I mean, the child who is born today has one chance out of two to become a centenarian, to reach 100, if he's born in the right part of the world. When I will have finished my presentation, you will have gained 28 more minutes of life expectancy. This is the way a prominent demographer uh, kept us interested in what he was saying uh, at Oxford University. But in spite of this objective sense of progress, there is a contrarian sense of apprehension in front of chaos. Why? Well, I think if I were to give one interpretation for the triumph of fear, one sentence which would, in a few words, encapsulate everything, I would say that we are living exceptional moments with unexceptional leaders. We sense that there is a divorce, a discrepancy between the complexity of the challenges and complexity and multiplicity of the challenges we are facing and the personalities of the leaders of the world. This is why, to some extent, the comparison with 1914 comes back to haunt us. This is why, to some extent, there is a certain, a certain Proustian nostalgia for the order imposed by the Congress of Vienna 200 years ago. It's interesting. 1914, World War I starts. 1814, the Congress of Vienna starts. World War I. If you read the great book, there are two great books about that period that were recently published. The Sleepwalkers by Christopher Clark gives you a general impression of what the preparation to the war was about. And there is another book, less popular, slightly more difficult to read, uh, but at least as interesting. It's by the great Canadian historian, Margaret Macmillan, The War That Ended Peace. And I think the conclusions of Margaret Macmillan are probably even more interesting for us than the sleepwalkers' allusions. She says in her conclusion, I've been studying World War I for all my life. I wrote a book on the Versailles Treaty. I just wrote a book on the causes that led to war. And I can tell you, after studying 50 years that war, I can't say who is responsible for it. The more I studied, the less I know. But I can tell you something. If the people who were in charge of Europe in the 1870s had been in charge of Europe in the 1910s, the war 
may not have come about. They lost control because the generation of the Bismarck and the Salisbury had disappeared and be replaced by another generation of much less prominent leaders. And this is the feeling we have today, that the world is truly exceptional and the leaders in charge are truly unexceptional. Why are the moments we are going through so exceptional? Because they are the encounter between a tectonic shift of an historical nature and very violent regional developments. And the second ones are able to develop themselves in such a dangerous way because of the first factor, the tectonic shift. The years we are living are exceptional because for the first time in at least three centuries, the West is no longer in control. The West is challenged. The West has lost its monopoly for model. The torch of history is shifting. But the West has not been replaced. So we are in a dangerous period of transition. The one who were in charge have no longer the means, the will, the historical spirit to do the jobs they used to do. And those who are coming are not yet ready, not yet willing. And this gap explains our deep sense of loss of control. Who is in charge of the plane? From the 18th century on to 1914, the European West dominated the world. Since 1941, the American West dominated the world. Today, the number one country in the world, the indispensable nation in the world, remains the United States of America. But the United States of America is no longer what the United States of America was. And the relative decline of America has been greatly accelerated by the eight years of the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration. An unnecessary war in 2003 that is the turning point in the creation of ISIS. I mean, we are obsessed, rightly so, legitimately so, by the fate of the Christian community in the Middle East. But we should have considered, too, the fate of a majority that feels emotionally as a minority today, i.e., the Sunnite. The Sunnite felt crushed in 2003 in Iraq. They felt abandoned in 2013 in Syria. They were ready to fall prey to the propaganda of the fundamentalist of ISIS. I think this turmoil in the Middle East will continue 
to haunt us for years. Middle East is the unfortunate meeting point of too much energy wells and too much negative emotions. It's going to be so. It's going to remain so, even if the United States of America no longer depends upon the oil from the Middle East for its energy consumption. But you see in the Middle East the encounter between an archaeology of dysfunctioning factors. The first one is a long sense of historical decline. When we were in, the, in what we call our Middle Ages, the Islamic world was in full bloom renaissance. And you could see the difference between Andalusia and the castle in Brittany. When we reach our renaissance, they started their decline. And they have felt for centuries that they were not in control of their lives collectively and now individually in our respective countries. The great historian of the Ottoman Empire, Bernard Lewis, writes about the Battle of Abukir in the very end of the 18th century, where the British fleet, led by Nelson, crushed the French fleet. And the fate of Egypt is being decided in that naval battle for more than a century. And the Egyptian population has nothing to do with it. And they feel that there is a repetition of that at the beginning of the 20th century, when the West gives contradictory promises to the Arabs and to the Jews. And for them, the culmination of those humiliation centuries is the creation of the State of Israel, which is based on irreconcilable calendars. For the Jews, the creation of the State of Israel is the last achievement of 19th century European nationalism. Italians at the Risorgimento, Germans at the unification around Prussia. The Jews needed to have their states. But the moment the state is created in 1948, the decolonization process has started. And the last nationalistic phenomenon of European history could only be perceived as the last anachronistic imposition of Western imperialism on Arab Muslim land. And the last drop of humiliation has been the Arab Spring. The sense that even if we try, we fail. We took to the streets, Maidan Square in Cairo. The only place where maybe it has not yet failed and maybe it can succeed at the margin is Tunisia. But for the rest, Egypt as a dictator that is more authoritarian and probably as corrupt than the Mubarak regime. Syria is in the midst of a civil war. And there is that sense of humiliation that stems from the denunciation of our selective emotions. What would they say? Well, they waited passively as 200,000 Syrians were killed in a terrible civil war. 
And now that two American journalists are beaded in public, thanks to the media of internet, they are waking up. What's their sense of life? A Western life is so superior to an Arab life. What is it? The color of the skin? The nature of the religion? Not even. So there is that sense that they exist, but that they can only be heard through the most terrible manner. I remember writing after the Mera, a, a young Muslim who became sadly famous by killing Muslim soldiers within the French army and Jewish kids in a school in the city of Toulouse. I kill, therefore I exist. He could only make sense of his life by destroying the life of others. So, the Middle East is in turmoil. America is in relative decline. Where is Europe? When it comes to the international scene, I'm afraid to say Europe is not an actor in deep geostrategic terms. There are European nations that are playing an important role. And I must say my country is one of them. But where is Europe? It is deeply hesitant, reluctant, divided fundamentally. And it would wish globally to behave like an ostrich, not to see the realities of the world around itself. And there are no substitute. Because China is looking at the world with a sense of confidence about our civilization and apprehension about our regime. A Chinese intellectual was writing recently, if China does not tackle the scourge of corruption, the country is doomed. But if China tackles the scourge of corruption, the party is doomed. And this is the situation. China is. The demonstrators in the street of Hong Kong tonight are not violent. They demand the respect of what they had. But seen from Beijing, they are a terrible existential threat because they are setting up an example like the Ukrainian for the Russian on Maidan Square. What if the Russian citizen wanted to follow the path of the Ukrainian and come closer to Europe in terms of values? What if the citizens of mainland China were to say, well, we may not want democracy, but we want the rule of law. And what they are, what they are standing for is maybe something we need. And the more the Chinese feel apprehensive about the decline of their economic growth, the more they may want to control fully the system or worse off, play nationalism to stay in power, to play to the nationalistic feelings of their population. The Indians, well, under Narendra Modi, they are for the first time discovering the benefits of diplomacy. I remember having a long meeting with the National Strategic Advisor 
of Prime Minister Singh, the predecessor of Modi, was in New Delhi. And uh, he told me, if you want to understand India today in the world, you have to think of America in 1918, at the end of World War I. We were surprised, like the Americans, by the way you looked at us. But we are not ready. We are not seeing ourselves as a world power. We are seeing ourselves as a regional power. Modi may be changing that, but very slowly. And the other, Brazil played international politics rather superficially and initially not that well, trying to, by itself, recreate a different relationship with Iran. And that's it, because the European Union is not an actor on the international scene. So, to a large extent, China today is like the United States. In 2014, China will be probably the first economic power in the world in gross terms. But America became the first economic power in the world in 1872. And America became a superpower in 1941. It took America 70 years to fulfill in geopolitical terms its economic status. Exceptional moment, unexceptional leaders. I think in the democratic part of the world, there is a problem of a structural nature. The qualities you need to be elected are not the qualities you need to govern. And in the oldest, more powerful democracy in the world, that is the United States of America, the institutions of democracy no longer work. Vetocracy has prevailed over democracy, to use the sentence of Francis Fukuyama. Institutions that were invented by the philosophers of the Enlightenment at the end of the 18th century to make sure that power would balance power are now paralyzing the most powerful nation on earth. Obama was a disappointment. Putin may pretend to be a strategist. I think historians of the 21st century will probably judge him otherwise. He's a brutal, shrewd, manipulative tactician. But a strategist he is not. He's taking reckless risks which are denying the realities of his country and the strategic direction he should be taking. The threat for Russia comes from the East, not from the West. The threat come for Russia comes from its demography that is still shrinking. Russian men have a life expectancy that is African, not Western. This is the problem they should be tackling. And they are not. I could go on with the lack of leaders. Suffice to say that in the traditional Middle East country, conflict, uh, between Israel and Palestine, the only person that could have been the equivalent of the clerk 
Rabin was assassinated by an Israeli, and Mandela was never, and Arafat was never the equivalent of Mandela. The list is impressive, or to be more precise, unimpressive. So, what can be done to contain fear if fear is prevalent? And if worse than that, fear is legitimate. The first thing you have to say is that a limited fear is necessary to survive. The rabbit who would ignore the existence of the hunter would not live long. The young man being a tourist right now in the Algerian mountains that are controlled by the fundamentalist uh, is taking a huge risk for his life. Fear is one of the most basic instinct for survival. But excessive fear is one of the most dangerous emotions. And so there are two things political leaders can do with fear. The first one is to play with it, to encourage it, to make of it a weapon of your ambition. This is what George W. Bush did in 2003, and of course, he came after 9-11. This is what populist parties are doing all over Europe, instilling fears in people. In fact, there is some kind of objective alliance between Putin ISIS and the populist parties of Europe. They are encouraging each other. In fact, Putin is very popular among the populist parties in Europe. They are united by a common despise for democracy. Just listen to Putin. What does he say in private? That Democracies are doomed, inefficient. He used one word, decadent, and he has two absolute proof of that decadence. The United States of America have elected a black man as a president, and homosexual marriage are now openly encouraged in the West. He links those two factors and he says, you see, they are decadent. And there is an alliance between the populist parties and that saying. And to some extent, though they would denounce them, the rise of ISIS in the Middle East, the presence of thousands of young Muslims or converted to Islam in their ranks is the proof that what they were saying was right. That unfortunately their compatriots did not listen to them. They should have known better. We told you this is happening now. Now you better listen to me now. And in my country, France, if one look at the polls that are taken today, they would say that the next president of France is going Marine Le Pen, is going to be Marine Le Pen. Personally, I don't think this is going to happen. And as a citizen, I will do my best to prevent that from happening. 
the very fact that they could think that it is possible is a shock. How can we preach democracy to others when we behave that way with our democratic values? So the only other way to deal with fear is to try one's best to contain it by responsible pedagogy, by education. One needs to explain as clearly as possible the challenges we are in, the challenges we are faced in in the world we live in. And to say, well, it's a tough moment. It's a very delicate moment. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. And this is the way we are going to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But again, that presupposes a leadership of a high quality. And we're back to the same problem. Now, I don't know how long I've spoken because I didn't know when I started. I fear might I look in the eyes of my chair that my time has expired a few minutes ago. Uh, so I should probably stop here so as to allow time for questions and potentially answers. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your patience. It's all yours now. Professor Moisi, um, thank you very much for your interesting and, um, I may say, f fascinating um, lecture. Um, you told us a, a lot, and I think there's a lot of issues we could discuss. Let me start with, I think, a central point of your uh, lecture, in, um, Europe as a culture of fear. Um, first of all, is this fear uh, really as it is today? It is this a kind of a cultural fear? Is that an exceptional fear? I can remember that in the, not personally, but from history, that in the 50s there was a great fear of at atomic war. And in the 60s, there was a great fear of the youth dera being, becoming derailed and uh, dangerous. In the 70s, there was a great fear of terrorism from the left. From the 80s, there was some other fear. Any, any period has its own fears and hang-ups. Um, is there something exceptional about the worries we have today in Europe? Compared to the years you mentioned, yes. In historical terms, uh, I suppose you can find uh, moments of equal uh, dominance of fear, much more so even. When in the early Middle Ages, there was the fear of the Vikings. Uh, <laughs> and they, they, they didn't have a good reputation. Um, what is exceptional in the period we live in? Why is fear today different from fear yesterday? What makes that fear exceptional? First, you could look at it as a multiple layer, an archaeology of multiple layers of fears. I could see four of them. The fear of being invaded by the poorest. Just look at the Mediterranean. The thousands of people who die trying to reach the European dream. We know that in 2050, 
nearly one quarter of humanity will live in Africa. Nine million, nine billion people, two billion people in Africa. I have to remind you that in 1950, Africa had a population of 180 million people. It now has a population of one billion. How many Africans will want to live in Europe? The second fear is the fear to be left behind by the most dynamic. And that fear probably was higher, bigger, a few years ago when jobs were leaving for Asia, uh, we could not compete, uh, there are more appetite, and there are lower prices, lower salaries, unfair competition. We are left behind. The third fear is to be blown up by terrorists coming from the Middle East or Africa, mostly Muslim. And now there is that fourth fear linked to the third one, that the enemy is within us, that we've been breeding the monster by failing to give them a meaning. When I, th th there was that movie on the BBC, My Brother the Terrorist, uh, where you could see a young white British citizen now with a long beard, saying my life had no sense. I was drinking every night. I was about to touch drugs. Islam saved me. And now he's in jail because <laughs> uh, he wanted to practice his most radical interpretation of Islam. So those four layers of fear are encountering a situation where there is a crisis of the idea of progress and a sense of decay and a lack of opportunity. I mean, it's clear, and I speak of course as a Frenchman, unemployment is a social cancer it's a banality to say so, but it's real. Young people who are coming on the market are the children of parents who were already dominated by the threat of unemployment. Their approach to life is of a different nature. They are cynical. They are... Uh, Negative. Now, this being said, uh, to return to my country, again, uh, there's a deep contradiction. Uh, if you look at the Poles, the French collectively are the most pessimistic nation on earth. They are, most they are more pessimistic about their collective fate than the Afghans. But if you ask them individually, how do you feel? they would immediately say, oh, personally, I feel very well. And they prove it by making children. So there is that uh, deep contradiction, uh, which, uh, of course, one should be aware of. And it's also a contradiction that in Europe, with all its pessimism, uh, thousands of people are trying to reach Europe. Yes. Right? Yes. So for them, Europe is... Something of a, a, a paradise. A paradise. A paradise. Yeah. You you're not you're not in agreement with people who say that all those fears are blown up by politicians or by the media or whatever. They are exploited, but they are real. It would be much easier to fight those extreme forces, if those reasons for fear 
did not exist. If we could say, listen, there's no meaning. Uh, the rate of unemployment is below 5%. The rate of growth is above 3%. The rate of debt is inexistent. Uh, join our paradise. What are you talking about? No. <laughs> the rate of growth is very low. The rate of debt is very high. The rate of unemployment is uneven. And, uh, one of the worst things that could happen in Europe has happened. And it is what I would call a divorce of situation between France and Germany. We are no longer playing in the same league. And that's very bad for Europe at large. And this is very much the product of France failings. Uh, 15 years ago, the sick man of Europe was Germany. 15 years ago, there was a competitiveness rate in favor of France and not of Germany. All these figures have been, of course, completely transformed. Do you feel that um, a revival of of the European spirit. I mean, after the war, we had a time when people were very enthusiastic here in Holland too about the whole European project. And European Union was really seen as a, as a solution to um, the problem of peace and the problem of prosperity. Um, all those positive feelings seem to have disappeared. Is that also a reason for fear? Yes. Or is that fear perhaps a cause of the disappearance of that elan. Is there a connection between yes, the Yes, definitely. I, I think... But it's very important to realize uh, the calendar of that. Um, it has been said very often that the financial and economic crisis that started in 2007 has been at the origin of the European crisis. I strongly object to that. In 2005, the big crisis had not started. Our two respective countries voted no to the constitutional treaty. The crisis preceded, the crisis of Europe preceded the crisis of the finance and the economy. That's a very important thing. But it's true that Europe is no longer perceived as the solution. Europe is perceived as one more problem. And uh, the lack of incarnation in Brussels has had a terrible negative impact on the perception of Europe. In my field, European affairs, uh, foreign affairs, uh, international relations, we have moved from a very decent woman with courage, but total lack of experience, Catherine Ashton, to a very young foreign affairs minister. How can she face Putin? How can she have a strong dialogue with Xi Jinping? She cannot. And she was chosen in spite of that. Or was she chosen because of that? You are more severe than I am. <laughs> You're probably more right than I am. No, she was chosen because um, the Italian prime minister wanted to have something. And it was the only European success story lately. And uh, other key positions were given to other nations. And she was a woman. Mm. He had a woman available. So a sense of balance between gender led to uh, the worst scenario mm. <laughs> for Europe. You mentioned in your lecture that Europe as a whole, as, as a union, doesn't play uh, an important role on the world stage. 
um, would an improvement of that rule by strengthening the European Union, would that be good for all countries in Europe? Would that be a solution to the pessimistic atmosphere we experience today? Well, the fact that the most powerful country in Europe, Germany, is also the country that for historical reasons is the country that has the best vaccination against populism is a reassuring thing. And the strongest country in Europe is also the most pro-European country in Europe. Because federalism for the German means what we are. For the French, it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's a sacrifice, which we are not ready to do. But yes, I think um, at the beginning of the 18th century, Europe represented 20% of world population. In 2050, Europe will be around 6% of world population. In our last electoral campaign, Angela Merkel spoke those words. She said, we are the most powerful country in Europe, but we represent 1% of world population. Alone, we are minuscule. Together, we still are small. And I think, but how can you say to the Europeans, look, you have a threat coming from the east, a threat coming from the south. You are nothing if you try to resist individually. Your only chance to exist is to be together, truly together. But what does together mean? It seems like a very convincing proposition. Yes, except that if you live in Poland, you are obsessed with Russia. If you live in France, you are obsessed with Algeria and the Middle East. You don't have the same geography of terror. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, how do you create that? Well, it would be created in the worst manner if suddenly uh, Russia was returning to be the Soviet Union, or if terrorist actions were to develop in Europe on a high scale. So, will uh, the caliphate or Putin prove to be the instrument of European unification? The way Robert Schuman and Adenauer were in the 50s? Uh, I don't know. I, but the, the, the point I'm making, it's much easier to create a union around negative factors than around positive ones. But from that sense, uh, uh, the instruments of unification in the 50s and the 60s uh, were the presence of the ruins surrounding us. It was not difficult to understand what war within Europe had created. We were in the period of reconstruction. The last thing we wanted was a new war between France and Germany. And there were the Soviet tanks, not far, as an enticement to come closer. And there was the enlightened generosity of the United States. The United States are much less enlightened. Uh, the ruins have disappeared. But now the threats are coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I hear some murmurings in the lecture room. I think it's time for you to uh, make a contribution. Questions? The lady in the... Will you please wait for the microphone so everybody can hear you? Thank yes. you. 
Can you hear me like this? Yes, very well. Okay. Uh, in preparation for this lecture, I read your book, so my question is from what I read. Um, well, you state in your, of your mention in your book that uh, the subordinated position of women in Islam, but also in Africa, uh, is a hindrance for progress. Um, and you, you even stated that the, even, <laughs> sorry, the emancipation of women within Islam is one of the most powerful revolutions. Um, what do you expect to gain from this revolution? That's one question. The second question is, what can women from Europe or the United States contribute to help uh, women in the Islam or in Africa mm. or in both? No, it, it, and, and it, it's true. I didn't speak at all about Africa tonight, or very little, uh, through references. Um, Africa is the most contradictory of continents these days. For some, it's the continent of hope, the Asia of tomorrow. And they are supporting their case with the growth rate, which is on average 6% on the entire African continent. The huge resources, the population resource, and the fact that countries have rediscovered Africa and uh, have regained, have, re have given to Africa uh, a new sense of confidence in itself. But at the other extreme, uh, you have ethnic cleansing and pandemia. Africa is also the land of the Ebola uh, disease, which for the moment we have difficulties controlling. And it's true that one of the key cards of Africa have been African women. They've played a major role as economic, social actors. They've done what men have proven largely incapable of doing. And I made a comparison between the African world and the Muslim world where women are really not treated as equal. And uh, they don't contribute their share. Um, what can we do uh, to promote the role of women in the Arab Muslim world Honestly, very, very little. It has to come from them. Um, the more we would encourage them in that direction, the more it would be rejected as a sign of Western imperialism, cultural imperialism. I mean, the solution to ISIS cannot come from us. Bombing them will not destroy them. There will have to be boots on the ground. And those boots, by the end of the day, should not be ours, but theirs. We should help them, arm them, but not replace them. Because of the past, because of their emotions, which are not yet superseded. I mean, there was a call a few days ago after the execution of the French climber, not in my name. It started in London and it ended largely in London. There was a call for demonstration in Paris on the Republic Square on Sunday. Very few people showed up because it's too difficult for them. They have not yet swallowed the past. They have a grudge with the West and they feel singled out negatively if we ask them, but it's your problem. 
And they say, but we are French. You want to treat us as Muslims? You want us to demonstrate against Islam? And it's, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be singled out that way. To accept to do that would mean a confidence in themselves, which they do not have. The French Nobel Prize for Literature, Jean-Marie Le Clésio, had one beautiful sentence the other day uh, in uh, Le Monde. He said, the key to globalization is the relationship with other. And to coexist means understanding and accepting the difference of the other. It's not multiculturalism, it's interculturalism. I'm not becoming a complex mix, but I start with the assumption that the other should remain the other, and that it is my task to understand where his difference comes from and to accept it as long as it is not in direct violation with my values. I accept your difference, not if your difference is an absolute violation of the principles I'm standing for. And the past Yeah. No, but that, that's why there are some differences that I don't accept. I mean, uh, when Muslim men came in France and claimed that they are allowed to have four wives and therefore as many children that the French state would pay for, I would say the law of the Republic is that you are allowed you have only one wife. This is my rule. But if I preach them, I'm a Westerner. I'm modern. I'm the model you must follow. Given the history of our relationship, given colonialism, imperialism, whatever you want, I'm bound to be rejected. So what I preach for is the indirect influence, not the direct one. Thank you. Another question. Third row. Um, in the geography of emotions that you presented, the main actants seem to be individuals, groups of individuals, states and religions, and so on. And I was wondering how do uh, corporations factor into this list for two reasons. First of all, because they seem to be long on the list because of the amount of capacity and power they have nowadays. And second of all, because you seem to detect a certain deficient in leadership, whereas mm -hmm. perhaps it's to corporations where we look today for charismatic and powerful leaders? No, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a very important question. Uh, and it touched upon a key factor, which is that the best people tend not to go into politics in the democratic world because the cost of politics is too high and because the reward of politics is too low. If you love power, you become the CEO of a big company and you have much more power, and if you do well for a much longer period of time. And multinational companies or corporate companies do play a geopolitical role. But 
there are no Mother Teresa and they cannot replace the state. The last thing they want to do is to replace the state. But it's very interesting because when I published that book in the Netherlands, The Geopolitics of Emotion, I was approached by a group of big bankers and they said to me, could you write a book about the emotion of the firm, the culture of the firm, because that would be very, very interesting. And, and in fact, they were willing to finance me to write that book. And, and I said, no, it's not in my field. Uh, I, I don't know uh, the culture of firms. Uh, the investment would be too long for me. And uh, I was probably very wrong uh, to refuse that. Uh, it would have been much easier for me to make progress into my uh, country home. Um, but um, yes, I think uh, firms have different cultures. Uh, Rabo Bank and Philips uh, have different approach uh, to business. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting them by sheer accident. Um, and I would have to integrate non-state actors. They do appear in the book, uh, but on the fringes, not in the center. Because in a way, I've seen myself as a psychoanalyst of the nation states for decades, but I didn't go beyond uh, the nation state. Now you have new groups, right? the multinational of terror, but they behave as a state. That makes them very vulnerable too. Now they have a territory they control, so we can bomb them on their territory. Another question. Wacht u even op de microfoon, alsjeblieft. Oh, ja. um, how can we go from this state of fear to a state of hope or trust or of emotions you describe? Is there a way out, out of fear? Yes. I, I, I really think so. I really think so. There is a way out. Um, but there are no universal recipes. Um, in a way, in some cases, you have to accept the end of the status quo. You have to accept that change is inevitable. This is what Mandela and de Klerk did so well. They recognized that the status quo was a recipe for disaster, that the continuation of apartheid would mean the end of a white presence in South Africa. I personally believe that the long-term survival of Israel goes through the legitimacy of Israel, that the main card for the security of Israel is its legitimacy. And by the end of the day, the legitimacy of Israel means the existence next to Israel of a Palestinian state. There are 13 million Jews in the world, which is exactly the margin of error in the calculation of the Chinese population. You always said there are 1 billion for that, more or less 13 million. 
It's puny. They need allies. They will not keep allies if their legitimacy is questioned. So there are cases where change is vital because the status quo that exists is a key to disaster. But there are cases, to the contrary, where the status quo has to be fought for, defended. And that's the European Union. Uh, we cannot accept that it has been a failure. We cannot look at ourselves in a mirror and say after more than 60 years, well, we tried, we failed, let's move on and reconsider. That we cannot do. And so the recipes uh, to make sure that fear does not prevail is a combination of lucidity, courage, political will, and by the end of the day, leadership. And all of that means education. Education to the difference of the other, education to become better. I, I mean, my country is destroyed from within by the crisis of the education system. We cannot compete any longer with the rigidity of our education system. It needs an urgent revolution. It needs an urgent decentralization. It's dead. This is the most urgent of reforms. It starts there. And nothing can be achieved without that. Of course, I'm retired, so it's easy for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> the guillotine of age has fallen upon my shoulders, so I can be a wise, irresponsible man. Ik ga eens helemaal naar achter. Meneer bijna bovenste rij. Uh, hello, man. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a very important thing because it's like uh, I'm from Africa and I'm from Sierra Leone. And then most people does not know the problem that Africa are facing today. And all we know about Africa is disease or is corruption. But one of the most important problem in Africa today is about fear. Because our politicians have been voted in out of fear. And then the politicians also, they have been ruling their people out of fear because like for example, as an African, we does not vote our president because of the merit. We vote because like a security for us. Okay, for example, if he is my brother, I believe it's like I'm going to vote him in because like he's going to provide for me security. Yeah. Which is one of the most important things that destroy Africa today. And then those little bit, even that when you go to Africa today, the only places where you can find development is from those areas where those presidents come from. Why? Because the thing is like by providing for them, I mean, their infrastructure and everything, then they can get, I mean, their security and everything. But how the African people would change that mentality to rule or to vote their leaders correctly? That is the problem we are facing in Africa today. I yeah. fully agree with you. Yeah. Um, but I'm not totally pessimistic. I see uh, the uh, coming of a new generation of leaders in Africa who are truly animated with a sense of public good, uh, that are not favoring their tribe, but their country. Uh, and of course, the boundaries of Africa are largely artificial. Maybe there are too many countries on the African continent, uh, but they are the result of uh, a colonization that was to a large extent a catastrophe for the sense of self-respect, followed by a decolonization uh, that was done badly uh, by former colonial powers that wanted to prove 
uh, that uh, uh, their newly independent country could not really live without them. And uh, with the process of time, uh, with economic growth, with education, there is a new elite that understands the meaning of public good. And I hope they will be very numerous in the future. Nog een vraag. Meneer met de blauwe trui boven. Yeah, thank you very much for your illuminating lecture. I just would wonder, you mentioned the United States, Europe, Asia, Africa, but what about the geopolitical role of Latin America and Australia? I'm curious to hear from you. Well, Latin America, I mentioned Brazil, uh, and in a way the, the problem is that uh, in Africa there's no equivalent of Brazil. No country plays the role in Africa that Brazils play for Latin America. It's not Nigeria, unfortunately. Uh, some people dreamt it would be South Africa, but after the death of Mandela, it's clear uh, it's not going to go in that direction. Um, I think, on the whole, Latin America is doing rather well. Brazil is not doing well right now, uh, but you see countries like Mexico, uh, like Colombia, uh, like Chile, uh, that are outdoing the hope we had in them. Of course, there's still Venezuela and Argentina that doesn't fail in disappointing us uh, at every corner. Australia, it's the West in Asia. And in economic term, they have greatly benefited from their proximity to China and other uh, countries of the region. But now they are also faced with the uncertainties linked to the Asian situation. I mean, there are countries playing the naval battle in the South China Sea. Uh, the risk of war by accident are real. Uh, and in a way, when I hear Abe in Japan and Xi Jinping in China, uh, I'm worried. And when you travel to Asia, when you are in Tokyo or when you are in uh, Beijing, they are looking at books about 20th century Europe. They were afraid that uh, 1914 in Europe would be duplicated in 2014 in Asia. In the same manner, war by accident. And this is one of the reasons why you have to look very carefully at, at what is happening in Hong Kong. It's not the specter of Tiananmen. It's something else. It's the temptation to use nationalism to quell political dissent. The failure you said um, that what the U.S. did in in the Middle East. If you take Operation Desert Storm as a uh, first example, we could say it's a failure. Um, personally, I think because of the underestimation of the U.S. in the in the Muslim culture, uh, and also by using their arrogance and their dominance instead of uh, trying to invest uh, with more energy to solve it from within, as you clearly stated yourself. Now you see with the IS war, they are practically doing the same. So my question is, why haven't they learned from their recent past? The last thing Obama wanted 
was to start a new war in the Middle East. And he saw that there was no alternative to that. It's a very tricky situation. There is this classical definition between war of necessity and war of choices. Critics of George W. Bush initially said that the war in Afghanistan was a war of necessity coming right after 9-11 and the war in Iraq was a war of choice. If I take that division, I would probably come to the conclusion that the present war against ISIS is a war of necessity. We cannot, we cannot allow ISIS to take control of Baghdad. And they are very close to Baghdad. We cannot allow them to take control of the entire region, not, not in the hands of the Alawite regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. The moment I say that, I will add air force alone may slow down their progress, but will not destroy them. By the end of the day, what we have started will need boots on the ground. And we know what boots on the ground mean. So we need a coalition of the Arab Muslim world against a force that is, first of all, threatening them. And the key regional ally is probably Iran. Sophisticated, Shiite, but Iran alone will not do it because that would be, again, a war of all against Sunni. We need Sunni forces against them. But Saudi will not do them, will not do that. Turkey could do it, but Turkey is very ambivalent. And Turkey is not Arab. I'm Muslim, but they're not Arab. If we let things develop today as they do, the next victim will be Jordan and the next victim will be Lebanon. Can we passively stand still as a real terrorist state of such magnitude exists in the very heart of the Middle East? My answer is not. So it's a war of necessity. I don't like it. I can see the cost. I can see the risks. But I don't see an alternative. What would you say to someone who argued that perhaps it's better to leave those conflicts alone in the sense of Arabs among themselves, Sunni and Shiite, um, figure it out for themselves. I mean, let the powers in that region find a balance among themselves without every 10 years a Western intervention disrupting everything. I would answer in the following manner. I may say it does not concern me, but the reality proves Otherwise, I may not be interested in their fate, but they are interested in my fate. And they are interested in the most negative manner. So I have to defend myself. This is different. It's not that I'm taking stand. It is that I'm defending what I stand for. They want, it, it's a very interesting story. I mean, they are using, they are turning the instrument of globalization against us. 
and they are doing it in a very shrewd manner. But it's the middle age at the age of internet. Twitter, social medias, but with values and practices that come from another age. And in a way, I think one of the weapons which should be the most decisive and which has not been used systematically so far is humor, derision. We have to outplay them at their game. We have to show how stupid these video games with real human lives are. This is not romanticism. This is absolute stupidity. And we have to mock them, to fight them on the website with humor. They react very badly to humor. Well, because we insulted Mohammed. Mm. I think, personally, I believe Lovely. <laughs> We should not insult what is considered as sacred in various cultures. You don't insult Mahomet when you speak to the Islamic world. You don't make fun of the Shoah when you speak to the Jews. You have to respect the dignity of the centrality of thinking of others. But if you don't insult Mohammed, if you play game with them, if you show how ridiculous, tragically ridiculous they are, you may protect young people from joining them. So the weapon of humor is necessary but to be used with caution. The war is also a, a war of propaganda, a of war course. of education. Of course, it's yeah. about, uh, this is about that. We have to show first that we are convinced they are going to be defeated. No terrorist movement on a large scale has ever won in history. Lenin used to say, It's tiring to be a revolutionary. It's even more tiring to be a terrorist. Except, of course, they have a very short life, usually. So it's less tiring. But we have to resist them with confidence, sense of humor, and intelligence, which means finding allies, finding ways to answer, them, but above all, making sure they don't recruit people. And that means respect for the other. That means treating them like equals, not giving them reasons or even alibis to go against us. And this is where the populist parties are playing a bad role. Uh, of Just, course. Yeah. This is where the populist party and ISIS are objective allies. Dames and heren, nog een vraag. Meneer het midden. Um given your uh, penetrating analysis of Western imperialism and uh, what it has caused in uh, the Middle East, I was wondering, is that not uh, a convincing case to be made that Putin has some justified fears? But he's exploiting them. Um, the war in Chechnya... Um, Proves him right on the one end. 
But some people are saying that he used that war uh, to consolidate his power. Some people are even saying that the terrorist attacks in Moscow uh, were not coming from Chechens, but from the secret services of Russia. I have no idea. The very fact that those suspicions were present show uh, the nature of the power and the attitude towards it. Xenophobia has been very strong in Russia for a very, very long period of time. It has always been the case. It comes from history and geography. They are Europeans and they are not in Europe. And their social system is partly European and partly Asian. We have to understand their singularity. And yet, resist the temptation to say, we should accept what Russia wants, because we need Russia. I mean, I hear so often people saying the value of geography should precede the geography of values. We have natural common energy interests with Russia that is our neighbor. We should not follow the path of the United States, who has its own values, its own interests. No. I think, for me, by the end of the day. The geography of values should precede the value of geography. And uh, I love Russian culture. I feel part of it myself because of my ancestors. But I feel humiliated by the mediocrity the vulgarity of recent Russian political culture. The gap between the two is too big. Putin, the first time I met him in 2000, I asked him, Who are, what are the portraits that are in your office in the Kremlin? And he said very quickly, Three, I have Peter the Great, Pushkin and de Gaulle. Peter the Great, the greatness of Russia. Pushkin, the greatness of Russian culture. Why de Gaulle? Because de Gaulle rebuilt France after the war. And I'm seeing myself as the man who is going to rebuild Russia. And now I'm told, I've not seen it, that there's a fourth huge picture in the lobby that leads to his office. And that's a painting of the Tsar Nicolas I. Why Nicolas I? Because his reign was the longest, 27 years. <laughs> because he was arch-conservative, because he was deeply religious, and played the orthodoxy as a game, and is the Tsar who was responsible for the war in Crimea. What you are witnessing in Russia today is something that I would describe as the red orthodoxy, combining religious ultra-conservative values with communist tradition is the red pope, the KGB pope. I do not recognize myself in those values. We have nog een beetje tijd, één of twee vragen. 
helemaal achterin. Um, it may be a kind of naive question, but does the world have a chance to ever achieve peace? That's a um, difficult a, question. No, no, there's a famous sentence in a French play which says, health is a very fragile situation that leads to no good. Maybe peace is like health. It's an unnatural, artificial situation. But you must do your best to protect it when it exists, to achieve it when it does not exist. Because the alternatives are terrible. But in a way, we... I mean, I've been, my, my, my life, um, I've started teaching international relations in 1972. So a long time ago. Um, more than 40 years. And I've been traveling all over the world to try to make sense of the countries. Uh, I was supposed to explain to others. And I'm, I'm still very emotionally moved with some maybe tears coming to my eyes when I can vote and when I know my vote will make a difference. Uh, and I hope I've transmitted that emotion to my children. And the scene of a market on the day of an election where people can walk freely, exchange freely, and then go to vote freely is so unique. We should not become cynical about that. We should be aware that we are privileged in the world to be able to live in peace, more or less, and to express ourselves in a democratic manner. Out of the 200 countries that are present of the United, in, at the United Nations, there are very, very few that can be proud of that. So it must be cherished as a precious jewel I mean, you may not know what democracy is about, but you realize immediately what the absence of democracy is. It sees you in the air. I remember traveling two hours from Paris to Bucharest in 1981. The atmosphere, I mean, I was in La Paz, I was looking for my air to breathe. It was dark. It was the reverse of enlightenment. And the air was missing. The moment you entered East Germany, Checkpoint Charlie, you knew there was something missing. And it was in the air you breathed. But it's very difficult to convey to young generation who have never known, never lived, in an environment where democracy was absent. You don't know what democracy is until you meet non-democratic atmosphere. Thank you very much. <laughs>